existing tenants in these difficult times. Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. On Monday, minutes obtained by the BBC revealed that NHS leaders in Scotland had held secret talks about privatising parts of the NHS. They discussed a two-tier health system where patients would have to pay for treatment and prescriptions. These plans are completely against the founding principles of our NHS. Now, the First Minister likes to scaremonger about NHS privatisation, but it seems like it's already on the table in the SNP-run health service here in Scotland. Now, the, S the First Minister denies it, but can I ask her specifically, is she denying this conversation took place? Is she denying NHS chiefs discussed a two-tiered system in Scotland's NHS, which apparently she finds funny? And is she saying the meetings... Is she saying... Mr Ross, Mr Ross, let's just be clear from the outset that we are going to conduct ourselves in a courteous and respectful manner. We will hear one another when we are speaking, one at a time. Mr Ross. So the question to the First Minister on this important issue is, is she denying these conversations took place? Is she denying that NHS chiefs discussed a two-tier system in Scotland's NHS? Or is she saying the minutes of this meeting are wrong? First Minister. Well, firstly, Presiding Officer, can I just say it is, what, what is the best word to describe it? Bold for a Conservative to come here and talk about privatisation of the National Health Service. Thank you. The Conservatives who have done more than any other party in these islands, and at times they've had stiff competition from Labour, but have done more than any other party in these islands to privatise the National Health Service. I'm, I'm intrigued, though, uh, at Douglas Ross's line of questioning. I did an interview on Monday addressing the comments in the minute. The minute is there. I wasn't denying then that the conversation had took place, and I'm not denying now. It was a meeting of some uh, leading NHS directors. As a point of fact, it wasn't NHS board chief executives. Uh, but they were conversations, uh, not, to use another word that Douglas Ross used, plans. Because let me uh, let Douglas Ross into what shouldn't be a secret, but he clearly uh, doesn't understand it. NHS leaders, however much respect I have for them, and I have considerable respect for them, do not make government policy. The government makes government policy, and the founding principles of the National Health Service that this government has done more than any to protect and to enhance are not, and as long as I am First Minister, never will be up for discussion. Douglas Ross. Well, I have to say, I have to say, I think it's very bold for Nicola yes. Sturgeon to stand up and compare Scotland and other parts of the United Kingdom on privatisation when we know that in Scotland, private treatment is up 84% since the start of the pandemic compared to the rest of the United Kingdom that is half of that, 84% here in Scotland, less than half of that across the rest of the United Kingdom. But as the Health Secretary passes her some notes, which she passes back again, so that's clearly no use, Hamza, let's look at what the actual document said. Mr. It Ross. said health boards had the green light. It said that health boards had the green light from the leadership to come up with and present their ideas for the reforms. The reports of the document said, and I quote, areas which were previously not viable options are now possibilities. So will the First Minister reveal what areas that she wouldn't consider before are now on the table? And given that she has said that the ultimate decision would be with government ministers, who gave NHS chiefs the green light to consider these plans going forward? First Minister. Can, can you imagine Douglas Ross's reaction if I tried to dictate to NHS leaders what they were and weren't allowed to discuss in their meetings. I mean, let's just imagine that for a second. But in direct answer to his question, none of these plans 
none of these, uh, and they're not plans, but none of uh, these ideas uh, that would have any impact on the founding principles of the National Health Service are being discussed uh, or remotely considered by this government. Uh, that can't be clearer. Um, and certainly here in Scotland, it's government that makes government policy. But Douglas Ross talked about some figures uh, around private, NH, uh, private health uh, funding. Uh, so let me give him some facts on that matter. Exactly. Let's look at uh, people who self-fund for private uh, care. Uh, in Wales, that figure is 30% higher per head than in Scotland. Well, sorry, Douglas Ross introduced the comparison between yeah, yeah. Scotland and the rest of the UK. Yeah, exactly. And in England, and in England, in Thank England, you. Where, just in case, and I'm sure this is uh, not the case, anybody has forgotten, the Conservatives are in government. That figure is 15% higher uh, per head in England compared to Scotland. Uh, let's look at NHS use of the private sector. In Scotland, total spend on use of the independent sector uh, represents 0.5% of the total frontline health budget. In England, where the Conservatives are in power, that figure is almost 7%, oh. £12.2 billion. Oh. This government will take no lessons from the Conservatives when it comes to privatising the National Health Service. In fact, Presiding Officer, this government will take no lessons from the Conservatives on the NHS, full stop. Douglas Ross. Well, sadly, Sadly, in Sturgeon, Scotland, no one is getting any lessons today because teachers are on strike. But let's go back. Let's go back to the figures because the First Minister did not dispute that since the start of the pandemic, private treatments in Scotland have increased by 84%. In England, the increase has been 39%. Sorry, in the rest of the United Kingdom, the increase has been 39%. But let's go back to the point that I was making. Someone gave the green light within government. Now, we'd usually expect that green light to come from the Health Secretary or from the First Minister. But there is clearly a complete breakdown of communication between NHS chiefs and the SNP. The First Minister has literally, uh, standing up today, rubbished this meeting of NHS chiefs. She's saying that they are completely wrong. They are apparently acting on their own without ministerial direction. That is what the First Minister said. But the reports clearly state that NHS chiefs here in Scotland are worried about the prospect of a two-tier NHS. So if the First Minister is to be believed, NHS chiefs are not listening to the Health Secretary, but are going off to try and fix the NHS on their own with no government oversight. So is this not just another confirmation that Hamza Youssef is out of control with Scotland's NHS? Before, uh, before, first, minister, before the first Minister, before the First Minister responds, may I just remind members of the requirement to always address one another respectfully, First Minister? Respectfully, uh, presiding officer, even by Douglas Ross's own standards, this is a pretty lame and pathetic <laughs> line of questioning. He talks about a two-tier. He talks about a two-tier health service. Perhaps he's talking about the one that already exists, where the Conservatives are in government in England. Uh, there will not be a two-tier health service. Uh, while this government is in office in Scotland uh, because we are committed to the founding principles of the National Health Service and always will be. NHS leaders are entitled dis to discuss what they want. They do not uh, make government policy. The government makes government policy and I could not be clearer about that. And of course this is the government and I was health secretary uh, in the early years of this government. This is the government Thank you. That reversed the privatisation of our health service where it had taken place. I was the health secretary that brought Strakathro Hospital back into the public sector after Labour had privatised it. We were the government that ended the contracting out of cleaning and catering services that moved away from the ruinously expensive Tory Labour PFI uh, PPP contracts. And of course, uh, we were the government that ended prescription charges in Scotland because we support the founding principles of the NHS and we always will.
Douglas Ross. So last week, Nicola Sturgeon stood up and said we should trust her, not a shipbuilding expert who had advised the UN. This week, we've got to believe Nicola Sturgeon, not NHS chiefs who run our service here in Scotland. According to the First Minister, Hamza Youssef apparently hasn't lost control. Yet nurses are on, the, on strike for the first time ever. We have waiting times at record highs. People can't see their GPs and health chiefs are warning of a two-tier system in our NHS. It is quite clear, presiding officer, that the First Minister is in complete denial about how badly her health secretary is handling the NHS crisis, in denial about the scale of privatisation in the health service that she oversees, and in denial about Hamza Youssef's two-tier system that is already becoming the norm in Scotland. She has become so distracted focusing on her own political priorities that she no longer realises just how bad the situation has got here in Scotland. The minutes of this meeting of NHS chiefs claim there is a disconnect between what's happening on the front line and what the Health Secretary thinks is happening. They accuse Hamza Yusuf of, and I quote their words, being divorced from reality. They're right, aren't they, First Minister? First Minister. No, they're not. Uh, let me uh, set out some facts about the National Health Service. There is higher funding for the National Health Service in Scotland than there is for England's Tory-run National Health Service. Uh, there is higher staffing per head of population in Scotland than there is in England. And of course, NHS Scotland, thanks to the dedication of every single worker who works in it, is better performing than the NHS in other parts of the UK. And this government uh, will always work to protect the founding principles of the National Health Service, which is more than can be said, first Minister, I have to say. When the First Minister is responding to a question, can we ensure that we can only hear the First Minister's voice? Which is more than can be said for Douglas Ross, because he wants some reality. Let me give Douglas Ross some reality. Last year, there was an amendment passed in the House of Lords that would have explicitly protected the NHS and excluded it from trade deals that could undermine its founding principles. Tory MPs in the House of Commons voted to remove this protection. Guess who one of those Tory MPs was, presiding officer? Douglas Ross. Even when he gets the chance, he doesn't stand up for the principles of the National Health Service. This government always will. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Uh, presenting officer, on Monday, the BBC revealed that the NHS crisis created by this government had got so bad that health leaders had discussed charging for treatment. In response, the health secretary said that was abhorrent. But the truth is, there is already a two-tier healthcare system in Scotland. Can the First Minister tell the Chamber how many procedures were carried out in private hospitals in Scotland in the past year? First Minister. Um, I will provide that uh, precise figure, but as I've just said to Douglas Ross, uh, the people who self-fund for private uh, care in Scotland is lower uh, than it is in England, significantly lower, uh, and actually it's even more significantly lower in Scotland than it is where Labour is in government in Wales. That is the reality. Uh, because we protect our National Health Service in these difficult times and we always uh, will. Uh, Anna Sarwar talks about paying for treatment. Uh, let me repeat, this was the government that abolished prescription charges, something that Labour had many opportunities over many years to do uh, and failed completely to do. So just as I won't take them uh, from the Conservatives, I'll not take no lessons from Labour on the founding principles of our National Health Service. Anna Sarwar. Perhaps the First Minister will want to take lessons from the people having to actually pay for treatment in Scotland. Absolutely. There were over 39,000 patients treated privately in Scotland in the past year. That does not include the many private treatments carried out in individual clinics like dental surgeries. The number of people now paying for treatment without health insurance has increased by 72%. Often these are people who are forced to borrow money turn to family and friends, or even remortgage their homes to get health care that should be free at the point of need. So I know the First Minister doesn't like facts, but let's look at the facts. Almost 2,000 people have gone for private treatment for endoscopies and colonoscopies. Privately, these treatments cost an average of £1,195. 
Over 7,800 people have gone private for a cataract surgery, average cost £2,660. And a staggering 3,500 people have had a hip or knee replacement in a private hospital, average cost £12,500. These figures make clear that under the SNP, healthcare in Scotland is already a two-tier system. So does the First Minister accept that this goes against the founding principles of our NHS, a universal healthcare system, free at the point of need? First Minister. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I don't accept that, and I don't accept we have a two-tier uh, health system in Scotland. Uh, we will always act to protect the founding principles, and we've done uh, more than any other government uh, to achieve that. Uh, the one thing that was missing completely from Anna Sarwar's question there, of course, uh, was reference to a global pandemic that caused the cancellation and the pausing of elected services in our National Health Service for a considerable period of time. Uh, that's why we've seen an increase in those figures in recent years, but these figures remain significantly below the comparable figures in England and in Wales, where, let me remind Anna Sarwa, his own party yep. is actually in government and running the National Health Service. As we continue to progress the NHS recovery plan, uh, get more operations done, and within waiting times in the National Health Service, we will continue uh, to see the benefits of NHS care free at the point of of need for everyone across Scotland. Anna the, the First Minister just wants to deny the facts. I don't think the pandemic is a good enough excuse to say because it was a pandemic, it means it's okay for you to have to go privately to go and pay for treatment. The First Minister denies we have a two-tier system. In 2021, 40% of all hip and knee replacements that happened in Scotland were paid for privately. 40%! That's 3,000 430 people paying privately to get a hip or knee replacement. Our NHS is at risk because of this government's choices and this government's crisis. After 15 years in government, there is no one else to blame. Take responsibility for your record. Hospital beds, cut. Nursing and midwifery training places, cut. Record long waits in A&E, 750,000 Scots on an NHS waiting list and people forced to go into debt, to go private, undermining the very principles of our National Health Service, the Labour Party and our country's greatest ever public service achievement. And doesn't it get clearer every single day that our NHS is not safe in SNP hands? First Minister. Well, we have record, record numbers of people working in our National Health Service, significantly more than when this government took office and significantly more proportionately than any other part of the UK, including where Labour is in government in Wales. Um, and in terms uh, of how we're responding, Anna Sarwar says the pandemic shouldn't be used as an excuse. I agree with that, but nor can it be ignored in terms of the impact on our National Health Service. So all of the figures he quotes, uh, he takes no account of that impact of a global pandemic on our National Health Service. But what are we doing? We're building up the capacity of our NHS. So I referred in response to Douglas Ross to one of the things I did when I was Health Secretary, brought back in to public ownership Stracathro yep. Hospital, which had been privatised yeah. by the last Labour yeah. administration. Uh -huh. uh, more exactly. recently, exactly. earlier, Jackie Bailey, of course, was a member of that administration. Yeah. Yeah. Earlier this year, yeah. uh, we have brought another private sector hospital, uh, Carrick Glen in Ayrshire, into public ownership. Yeah. That facility will be developed to become one of our new national treatment centres, building up the elective capacity of our NHS to treat more people. Uh, that's the practical action this government is taking, and we are taking that and always will take that uh, while we protect the founding principles of our National Health Service. I intend to take general and constituency supplementary questions after question seven. Members who have already pressed, please do not repress, but members who wish to put a question on questions three to seven, please do so at the appropriate point. And I call Tess White at question three. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of emergency response to flooding in the northeast of Scotland in recent days. First Minister. Uh, first of all, presiding officer, can I say that my thoughts are with the family and friends of Hazel Nairn, who remains missing after the recent flooding, and I know there has been some uh, distressing news uh, on that this morning. 
Uh, the Scottish Government's resilience room was activated throughout uh, the incident to support the local response. Uh, Transport Scotland also activated its multi-agency response team and Transport Scotland resilience room. Uh, we will now work with partners to reflect on the response and ensure that any lessons identified are taken on board and built into contingency planning and response arrangements for the future. Um, as the clean-up continues, I want to take the opportunity to thank our emergency services and all local resilience partners, including the voluntary sector for their ongoing work to ensure those communities most affected are kept safe and urgently get the support that they need. Tess White. Presiding officer, I associate myself with those remarks from the First Minister. Please allow me to pay tribute to Hazel Nairn, who tragically went missing during Friday's adverse weather. As the search continues, my thoughts are with her family and the responders on the ground. First Minister, in Brechin, two of the pumps belonging to the town's £16 million flood defences failed, flooding homes and causing extensive damage. Villagers raised concerns with me about the safety of an electrical substation in Inch Bear, which was half submerged in water for days. Communities rallied together over the weekend, but improvements do need to be made to the organisation of the emergency response to weather events like this. How? Will the Scottish Government work with local resilience partnerships to e expedite this process and reassure people in my region that every possible step has been taken to protect them? Thank you. First Minister. Well, can I thank Tez White for, for raising these issues? They are uh, extremely important issues to any community affected by severe weather incidents. In terms of uh, Brecon, uh, again, an important issue to raise. Uh, the main flood defence in Brecon, uh, which contains the South Esk River, uh, held, uh, and that is despite river levels provisionally reported by SEPA being the highest ever on record. Uh, and it's worth pointing out, had these defences not been in place, there would have been widespread and potentially dangerous flooding of an estimated 332 properties beyond anything yet experienced by Brecon. However, two of three pump stations which remove surface water uh, from River Street from runoff and other sources did not start automatically when water was detected. And as soon as this was identified, a council officer attended and the pumps were at that stage successfully started. We work closely with local resilience partnerships on an ongoing basis and it's uh, very important that we do so um, and any time there is a severe weather incident like this we ensure that any appropriate lessons are learned and that will be the case here and that will be done as quickly as possible if there are any issues raised uh, by locals uh, about concerns i've not touched on today uh, if these are passed to the government we will sh sh ensure that they are fed in uh, to that process of reflection and uh, learning of lessons mercedes vialba we are already seeing the effects of the climate emergency with further extreme weather events becoming more likely. The National Infrastructure Commission has argued that governments should set resilient standards which operators would be required to meet. The UK government is set to introduce a national resilience strategy, so will the First Minister make the case for the development of resilient standards for vital public infrastructure? First Minister. Uh, yeah, yes, I'm very happy to look at it. And of course, it's important that these uh, principles are included in all the work the Scottish Government does as well. Uh, the member is right uh, to raise the climate emergency because these severe weather events, of course, are being caused by climate change. Um, so it's really important that everything we do recognises that. Uh, the climate emergency, of course, is central to all of our infrastru infrastructure planning work. Um, and it's important that we continue to develop it in that way. But I'll certainly uh, take uh, that particular proposal um, and ask the uh, minister concerned to write uh, to the member with further detail about how we we will liaise with the UK government on it. Question number four, Evelyn Tweed. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that gender-based violence is being tackled in Scotland, in light of the start tomorrow of the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. First Minister. Uh, violence against women and girls is abhorrent. Uh, that is why Equally Safe, our strategy to address violence against women and girls is so vital. Uh, we have already strengthened legislation, taken action to address the social drivers that perpetuate gender-based violence and invested record uh, levels of funding in frontline services and in supporting survivors. 
The Domestic Abuse Scotland Act criminalises coercive and controlling behaviour, and we have taken forward work to ensure those working in the public sector can uh, confidently and sensitively work with those affected by violence against women and girls through Equally Safe in practice. The Delivering Equally Safe Fund provides £19 million this year to support over 120 projects that focus on early intervention, prevention, as well as on support services. Evelyn Tweed. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Research continues to show an enormous prevalence of gender-based violence in all areas of life. For example, the Trade Union Congress found that more than half of women in the workplace have experienced sexual harassment, but 80% of them did not report it. What is this government doing to ensure misogynistic abuse is taken seriously and survivors feel able to report it? First Minister. Uh, this is uh, an extremely important issue. Uh, Baroness Helena Kennedy's report on misogyny and the criminal law commissioned, of course, by this government and published earlier this year, made several recommendations to address gaps in the law that could be addressed by new criminal offences to tackle misogynistic behaviour. Uh, some of these are, of course, controversial, uh, and we're committed to consulting on proposals that would give effect to these recommendations uh, in this parliamentary year. Uh, the TUC report underscores the importance of ensuring that victims of misogynistic behaviour do feel empowered to report with confidence uh, that their concerns will be taken seriously by their employer and where criminal activity is alleged uh, by the police as well. Pam Gossel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week, a United Nations expert on violence against women has condemned the SNP's gender recognition reforms. The United Nations claims that this bill could allow violent males to access women-only spaces, posing a risk to the safety for both women and trans women. The expert appealed to the Scottish Government to set aside more time to consider the bill's possible unintended consequences. Can I ask the First Minister, does she agree with this United Nations expert that this bill should be postponed so that these legitimate concerns about the women's safety can be addressed? First Minister. Um, I believe that uh, those who are responsible uh, for violent attacks on women uh, are those who perpetrate uh, those attacks. And where that is, as is uh, very, very often the case, violent men, it is violent men that we should be focusing on. Uh, they continue to pose the biggest risk to women. Um, and I don't believe we should further uh, stigmatise the trans community because of the actions of violent men. Uh, violent men uh, right now uh, who want to access women-only uh, spaces do not need a gender recognition certificate uh, to do that. Uh, so let's focus on the problem. And when the problem is violent men, that is the one that we should focus on. Uh, in terms of uh, the comments uh, by the person from uh, the UN, uh, of course, we will respond in full to that. I'm not sure the comments are quite as they were uh, characterised in uh, the question, but the Social Justice Secretary will respond in detail on the issues uh, raised. Many of these issues have been discussed and addressed uh, already by Parliament uh, during stages one and two of the bill. And of course, Parliament will have the opportunity uh, to discuss the bill again at stage three of the legislative process shortly. Question number five, Russell Finlay. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister how much the Scottish Prison Service has spent on providing free mobile phones to all prisoners. First Minister. Uh, at the start of the pandemic, uh, we took the decision to provide mobile phones to those in custody to maintain vital family communication, including and perhaps especially with children, uh, during what was an incredibly challenging period and when normal visiting, of course, uh, wasn't possible. Uh, between then and April, uh, the amount spent to date is £4.12 million. Russell Finlay. Uh, thank you for that answer. Uh, First Minister, your government is slashing budgets for our cops, courts and prisons. Money is tight. We get that. So how on earth can mobiles for prisoners at a cost of £4 million and rising be a priority? Taxpayers' money should be spent on frontline services, not freebies for criminals. These phones, these phones have been misused nearly 5,000 times. They've been used to order firebombings, 
drug dealing and to threaten crime victims. Prison officers tell me these SNP-issued phones are putting them in danger by fueling violence between inmates. So when, First Minister, will you bin this costly and dangerous policy? First Minister. Well, Russell Finlay is right about one thing. Uh, budgets are extremely uh, tight. They are tight because of Tory economic uh, mismanagement and Tory erosion of our budgets. Coming to the issue at hand, prison is, yes, about punishment, but prison should also be about rehabilitation. Uh, and it is important that we uh, don't lose focus uh, on that. Uh, the mobile phone uh, provision, which of course I think, I'll be corrected if I'm wrong about this, but I, I think is something the UK government uh, did uh, as well during the pandemic. Uh, that is about ensuring connections between prisoners and families, including children, which is important uh, to rehabilitation, which is important to reducing offending and re-offending. So we will continue to consider all of these issues carefully, but we will consider them in the context of a justice system that, yes, uh, punishes criminals. That is extremely important, but one that also seeks to rehabilitate uh, those who commit crimes and reduce re-offending, because that's in the overall interest of communities across the country. Question number six, Stephanie Callaghan. I'm Thank suspending you. business for a moment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We will resume. And at question number six, I call Stephanie Callaghan. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the Supreme Court decision regarding legislating on an independence referendum. First Minister. Well, while uh, of course disappointed by it, I uh, respect and accept the Supreme Court's judgment on the Lord Advocate's reference uh, regarding the Scottish Parliament's powers to legislate for an independence referendum. However, presiding officer, the denial of democracy by Westminster parties demonstrates now beyond any doubt uh, that the notion of the UK as a voluntary partnership uh, of nations is not uh, now, if it ever was, a reality. It remains open, of course, to the UK government to respect democracy and to reach an agreement with the Scottish government uh, for a lawful constitutional democratic uh, referendum. However, regardless of attempts by Westminster to block democracy, uh, I will always work to ensure that Scotland's voice is heard and that the future of Scotland is always in Scotland's hands. Stephanie Callaghan. Thank you. Yesterday's ruling has profound implications for the UK and Scotland's democracy, particularly, as you mentioned, the notion of the UK being a voluntary partnership of nations. And if the UK government wants to evidence this as a voluntary union, all they have to do is stop standing in the way of democracy, come to the table and reach an agreement over holding a legal referendum with the Scottish government. Why does the First Minister think they are continuing to shy away from this? First Minister. Uh, well, unionist Westminster politicians uh, want to silence Scotland's voice because they're scared of what Scotland might say. It is quite simple. Uh, any politician who was confident of their case and confident of being able to persuade others of their case uh, would not be trying to block democracy. They would be embracing democracy. So I think we know everything we need to know. Uh, about the views of Westminster Unionist parties uh, by their determination to block Scotland's democracy, but it will not prevail. Uh, I think uh, Unionist politicians uh, with some critical faculties and perhaps the power of independent uh, thinking uh, probably understand uh, that yesterday's judgment raises uh, profoundly uncomfortable questions about the basis and the future of the United Kingdom. Any partnership in which one partner needs the consent of another to choose its own future is not voluntary um, and it's not even a partnership. 
Uh, you know, within the UK right now, it is the case that England could decide to become independent, but Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland supposedly can't. Uh, that is not a partnership, that's not voluntary and that is not equal. Uh, but Scotland's voice will not be silenced. Scotland's future is up to the people of Scotland and that will always be the case. Jim Fairley. <clears throat> Thank you, President Officer. First Minister, Douglas Ross keeps saying that no one on these benches is asked how you would stay in the union. Well, the answer is simple. Win an election with that in the, in the manifesto and you get to dictate the terms. So with that in mind, this Scottish Parliament has the biggest ever majority for an independence referendum in the history of devolution, but has been blocked from enacting that mandate. So can the First Minister inform the Parliament if she has had any indication from the UK Government as to how the people of Scotland can exercise their democratic right and have a choice in their future? First Minister. Well, the mandate uh, for an independence referendum in this Parliament is undeniable. There is a clear majority uh, for that. Uh, and uh, I think in any other measure of democracy in any other uh, country, we wouldn't uh, have politicians seeking to deny that. Look, I stand ready to uh, discuss this issue with the UK government at any time. I fully anticipate, though, that their democracy denial will continue, at least in the short term, because they are scared of the outcome of a democratic process. Uh, but you cannot, and I, I watched uh, Douglas Ross and others uh, squirming on this issue, uh, yesterday on television, on the one hand trying to say that the United Kingdom is a voluntary union, but on the other hand gleefully trying to defend the fact that Scotland has no way of choosing Thank a different you. future. It's not democratic, Briefly, it's First not Minister. sustainable. Uh, let's have a proper process and let the people of Scotland decide our own future. Craig Coy. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. When when asked by Glenn Campbell during a BBC debate two days before the Holyrood election what voters should do who, quote, and I quote, want you, Nicola Sturgeon, as First Minister, but don't want independence, the First Minister confidently said they should vote for me. Why now are her colleagues claiming that these voters support independence? And is, the same, is this the same deep-seated duplicity that we can expect to see in any de facto independence yeah, referendum at Thank the next you. general election? Briefly, First Minister. Uh, briefly. Presiding officer, you know, if the Tories are now reduced to suggesting that people in Scotland uh, didn't know that I supported a referendum, then the Tories are even more desperate than I thought they were. But Douglas Ross uh, is saying, it's just quoting my own words. Well, let me offer this, presiding officer. If the Tories don't think that my words were clear enough in the election last year, how about their words because the Tory message couldn't have been clearer they said if the SNP wins the election there will be a referendum the only way to stop it is to vote Tory that seems pretty clear to me presiding officer and guess what the SNP won the election it's time to have a referendum question number seven Sarah Boyack To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that refugees from Ukraine have suitable accommodation on arrival in Scotland. First Minister. With over 21,500 arrivals from Ukraine with a Scottish sponsor, Scotland continues to provide sanctuary to more displaced people from Ukraine uh, per head than any other part of the UK. Uh, and I want to thank people across uh, Scotland for their efforts in achieving that. Our priority, of course, is to ensure the immediate needs of those arriving are met, though we are clear we do not want anyone to spend more time than absolutely necessary in welcome accommodation. While well, we are ensuring that we have that welcome and temporary accommodation which is safe and suitable, uh, we're also taking forward a number of actions focused on providing sustainable longer term accommodation for those here and still arriving. Uh, that will include a new Scottish-led host recruitment campaign that will launch at the end of the month. 
Can Senator I thank Boyack. the First Minister for that answer and refer members to my register of interest? The First Minister will be aware of the acute housing crisis in Edinburgh. The current contract for MS Victoria is due to end in January 2023. Figures published by the Scottish Government show that over 1,200 people are currently on the ship. So how will the Scottish Government ensure that the capacity provided by the ship is retained? And will she urgently look to expand criteria for the £50 million housing fund for local authorities, which is largely unspent, to include purchasing property from the market and working with agents to retrofit buildings? And will the First Minister confirm continued funding for the city's welfare hub? Welcome hub. First Minister. Uh, we will continue to provide uh, support, yes. Look, these are very real issues, and Sarah Boyack is right uh, to raise them. They are issues uh, that all countries uh, that have stepped up to help Ukrainians are, are facing right now. I was... Uh, speaking with the Taoiseach at the British Irish Council just a couple of weeks ago, the Republic of Ireland are dealing with these issues too. I know the Welsh uh, Government uh, is as well, and indeed uh, the UK Government uh, in respect of England. Uh, it is right that we have welcomed as many Ukrainians as possible, and it is right now uh, that we work through these challenges. And I know Neil Gray has been keeping members and Parliament as a whole updated. Uh, so the £50 million uh, longer term resettlement fund is important and of course we will continue to look at the eligibility uh, for that. That is helping us bring void properties back into use. Uh, we're also investing heavily of course in our wider affordable housing programme and will continue to do that and uh, specifically in relation uh, to those displaced from Ukraine of course we will continue to work with Edinburgh City Council and local authorities across Scotland to ensure that that support can continue and let me take the opportunity to put on record my thanks to local councils uh, who have done fantastic work on this. So these are, are not easy uh, challenges for any government to navigate but we have a model obligation to do so and we will continue to work hard to ensure that we are doing right uh, by those from Ukraine who need our support and help and welcome. I call Colette Stevenson to be followed by Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. As members know, as part of the UK, Scotland's budget is tied to the poor decisions made by the Tory government at Westminster. However, however, there is another strain on public finances in Scotland, namely the repayment of private finance initiative debts designed by the Tories and rolled out by an enthusiastic Labour Party. Can the First Minister set out the current annual bill for Scotland's health service from Labour's decision to build hospitals, including Hare Myers and my East Kilbride constituency, using this reckless and costly scheme, as well as any impacts of the current cost crisis on these debts. Okay, just for clarity, this is general and constituency supplementaries, um, just, just for those who... Yeah, First Minister. <laughs> well, this question actually highlights uh, one of the ironies of uh, previous lines of questioning in this session of First Minister's questions. Uh, since 2006-07, the cumulative bill to taxpayers uh, for the cost of Tory labour ruinously expensive PFI PPP contracts is £3.2 billion. Uh, that's £2 billion over and above the initial capital value of these projects, uh, with costs increasing because of inflation. And right now, we are currently paying every year more than £250 million for these contracts commenced under previous administrations. And that does include, uh, of course, include Hearmeyer's Hospital. The record of this government, in line with our record of protecting the National Health Service, is one of unpicking Tory Labour PFI PPP contracts. I call Jamie Green to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Adrienne McCartney spoke to the Sunday Post last year and shared her harrowing story about how time after time the police and prosecutors let her down on a case of domestic abuse. The Sunday Post revealed last Sunday that sadly Adrienne has since passed away. Her solicitor said the following, she should be here today and the fact that she's not is an indictment of a system and how it addresses domestic abuse. Uh, First Minister, one leading academic believes that the statistic for those who are dying of domestic abuse could be six times higher than official statistics due to ill health and, of course, suicide. Given that we are putting such a focus on the elimination of violence against women this week in the Parliament, 
Can I ask, quite simply, why is the justice system currently in Scotland failing so many vulnerable women? And secondly, what legislation is the First Minister and her government proposing to bring forward to address these horrific crimes against women? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, can I take the opportunity to convey uh, my uh, deep heartfelt sympathies to the family and friends of Adrienne? Um, obviously, police and prosecutors operate independently of government, so I, I won't uh, go into details that would stray upon their uh, independent roles. But what I will say, uh, and I've said many times before, I don't believe Scotland, or any country for that matter, uh, yet does enough uh, when it comes to preventing and responding to domestic abuse. The justice system has got uh, a very large part to play uh, in all of that. But as I was uh, reflecting earlier on today, we need to do more uh, to tackle the behaviours that cause uh, domestic abuse and prevent it in the first place. But we also have to, I know the Lord Advocate uh, is a big advocate uh, for and champion of this. The justice system has to respond uh, better uh, to support victims of domestic abuse as well. And I know this is a real priority uh, for her. Uh, now, I've already uh, spoken, and this is wider, obviously, but I've already spoken about the Helena Kennedy report on misogyny. Uh, we have proposals as well from uh, Lady Dorian in terms of how the justice system uh, deals uh, with cases of sexual violence, sexual offences, and that will include domestic abuse. Uh, the government will bring forward many of these proposals uh, in legislative form uh, over the remainder of this parliament. Some of them will be controversial, and I would expect very rigorous debate and scrutiny in this parliament. But I hope as we are considering these proposals, uh, that very good question uh, from Jamie Green will stay in our minds uh, and that we will find ways to unite to make the necessary improvements to our justice system uh, so that victims of domestic abuse are not let down uh, here in Scotland as they are here too often and indeed as they are in countries across the world. Jackie Bailey to be followed by Claire Adamson. The breast screening programme was paused for all women during the pandemic and paused even longer for women over 70. It would appear that a further restriction has been applied and women over 75 are being denied breast cancer screening. My constituent who raised this with me describes this decision as discriminatory and ageist. Can the First Minister advise whether this restriction is just in Greater Glasgow and Clyde or does this apply Scotland wide? And if so, will she reverse this decision? First Minister. Well, I'll ask the Health Secretary to write to the member uh, on uh, the detail of that, because it's important that uh, we make sure uh, that is right. In terms of uh, the restoration of the breast screening uh, for the age groups uh, for which breast screening is advised, that is already, uh, of course, has already, of course, happened. In terms of the older age groups, which are on a self-referral basis, that has been done in a phased uh, way. Uh, but I'll come back to Jackie Bailey via the Health Secretary on the detail of that. Can I say one thing finally, as somebody, uh, of course, who's responsible for uh, all of the decisions that were taken during the pandemic? These decisions were not taken lightly. The pausing of the screening programmes including the breast screening programme, uh, was one that I know uh, was agonised uh, over uh, by the, the then Chief Medical Officer and by others, uh, of course, responsible for those decisions. Uh, so it's important that we get these uh, right um, and that we prioritise those for whom breast screening is, is recommended, which is what has been done. Uh, but of course, as part of the overall recovery plan for the National Health Service, uh, our priority is to get all services uh, back to functioning as they were before the pandemic and as people have a right to expect. Claire Adamson to be followed by Liam Kerr. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Following the UK regulations to adop adopted by the Financial Conduct Authority for funeral planning companies, a number of companies have sub subsequently gone into administration, including Safe Hands, Funeral Plans and One Life. Some of my constituents are left worried as to whether they will get any of their money back, and research shows that such saving schemes are overwhelmingly used by the most financially vulnerable. Can the First Minister offer any advice or support that is currently available for those affected? And has the Scottish Government had any engagement with the UK Government in relation to calls for a UK support scheme to be set up? First Minister. 
Uh, well, can I thank Claire Adamson for raising uh, what is not just an important issue, but of course uh, also an extremely sensitive issue. Uh, we welcomed regulation of this sector, uh, something we had been pressing the UK government to do for some time. Uh, I think the UK government's action, however, welcome has come uh, rather late and too late for some people. Uh, I understand that dignity is currently uh, honouring safe hands, funeral plans, um, and I welcome uh, that support. Of course, regulation is a reserve matter, and I would encourage the UK government to look at the situation and consider if they should provide additional support. Um, if Claire Adamson uh, wishes to pass on any details of affected constituents, I'll ensure that the relevant minister uh, looks uh, at this and raises it with the UK government. Uh, the Scottish government, of course, also provides support for funeral costs through funeral support payment, and I would encourage anyone who may be eligible to apply. Liam Kerr to be followed by Martin Whitfield. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In February, I asked what action this government was taking after a survey showed that nearly half of our dedicated, hard-working teachers in Aberdeen were considering quitting due to high levels of physical and verbal abuse. At best, the First Minister's answer was vague and non-committal. Now, yesterday evening, following physical and verbal violence, Northfield, uh, Northfield Academy in Aberdeen escalating, Teachers at Northfield voted in favour of industrial action over concerns for the safety of staff. First Minister, teachers should never be subjected to violence, whether verbal or physical. And as nothing has apparently changed since February, I ask again, what is this government doing now to stop this appalling abuse? First Minister. No, no teacher uh, should ever experience abuse in the classroom, and I hope that is uh, something that would unite us across this chamber. Uh, of course, the employer of teachers uh, are local authorities, and I would expect, and I know local authorities take this seriously, um, them to have support in place uh, for teachers and to support the well-being of teachers. And uh, I'm indeed meeting with the president of COSA uh, later today uh, and will happily discuss what more the Scottish Government can do uh, to support that. It is vitally important that we support teachers in a range of ways and indeed uh, other public sector workers and other workers generally uh, who interact with the public uh, to ensure that they are free from and safe from any abuse or attacks whatsoever. <coughs> And Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Presiding Officer. Following the First Minister's correction to the official report on that energy consumption, will the First Minister's new understanding of the facts cause the Scottish Government to reconsider, reconsider its stance on all forms of net zero energy, for example, nuclear powers in the south of Scotland, which, as the First Minister can see, plays a vital role in energy security? First Minister. Well, my understanding of Scotland's energy potential is as it has always been. Scotland is blessed with vast renewable energy potential uh, and this government will focus on not just talking that up instead of talking it down like so many of the other parties in this chamber uh, do, but we will focus on supporting the growth of renewable energy, offshore wind, uh, onshore wind, hydrogen, green hydrogen energy. Uh, the fact of the matter is Scotland is one of the luckiest countries in the world when it comes to energy and it's our job to maximise that potential. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. There will be a brief suspension to enable people to leave the gallery and chamber quietly. Thank you.